Hi, I'm Jeff Frawley. I'm Mark Keating. And you're watching Learbird TV. Today, we're going to be working with some tug and some different play techniques. Uh, and we wanted to talk about it before we jump right into it. One of the interesting things that we're going to be doing here is we're calling it let your dog win. Yep. And how allowing your dog to win in our game can really be beneficial in our training. So what, uh, what can we talk about here to let people know kind of what we're doing? Sure. Uh, so tug play for me is huge. And for a lot of us, when we get into sports and we're getting we want high levels of drive to use for obedience and things like that. Tug play is an extremely valuable game. And it's just, the reason I wanted to talk about it with Jeff is a little controversy is sometimes not a bad thing. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of different feelings about tug play. So when I talk to people about, uh, oh, their dog has too much energy, they're destructive, things like that, I say, well, do you play with your dog? Well, yeah, a little bit, we wrestle. Oh, okay, well, that's funny, that's a little different. And I said, well, do you play tug? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, why don't you play tug? Well, uh, my, my vet said that it, I shouldn't do it. It creates dominance. Okay. And then the flip side of it, which to me is even more severe, is when I say, do you play tug? And they say, yeah, we play tug of war. He loves tug of war. Do you ever let him win? No, I never let him win. I don't want to create dominance. I want him to be submissive to me in the play. Well, to me, it's, a, it's completely backwards. So let's get to my theory. Tug play, first thing I'm going to ask you guys at home is, I think a lot of us, did you play tug of war when you were in elementary school? Right? Yeah. I, think I played tug of war it. in elementary school. A lot of times we'd have like physical fitness day and stuff. We'd have tug of war, long jump, you know, 50 yard dash stuff. Did you ever play tug of war when there was nobody on the other side? <laughs> That's the response I always get. Did right. you ever play tug with no, it's not a very fun game, is it? No, because it's an interactive game. You need two people. Now, so we're going to put the dog on the other side. What is the, when the dog wins, that is the most valuable feeling because when they legitimately win, they feel strong and they enjoy that. Well, in order for the dog to win again, which is the, after they win one time, oftentimes dogs want to replicate that feeling. So they want to win again. Well, how can they win again? They need us to win again. So they need to bring us the tug in order for us to grab it so we can re-engage the play. So you see, the dog is making the choice to engage me into tug play because I'm letting them win. And I think kind of the flip side of that, of people that say, oh, you can never let your dog win when you're playing tug. Mm -hmm. If you, and I don't like to humanize dog behaviors, mm -hmm. but if you're gonna try to apply that to a human behavior and talk about it and say you play sports or you yep. play video games, yep. If you're going to sit down and you're playing your favorite video game, if you never win, are you going to keep playing Absolutely. that video game? Or Absolutely what would the not. point be? Just, oh, I sit, I sit on my couch and I lose every time? Absolutely. You know, everybody, there's some things people like, uh, are, are naturally a little bit more good at. Say basketball. We can take basketball, for example. Uh, I, I did play basketball, not on the team, but I, I enjoyed shooting baskets and one summer I spent every day shooting baskets and I got better. I started sinking more baskets as I got along. So that feeling was reinforced. But again, if I would have never sunk a basket after a week, I go, well, I think I'm going to go home and play video games or I'm going to do something else. So it, it, success is, is a huge reinforcer. So with the dog winning, and especially if we let them win at the pivotal point, which we're going to demonstrate, the dog feels it, needs you again, wants to replicate this feeling. So the tug play is fantastic for working a dog out physically. It can also create a lot of our retrieve behaviors that we want, can create a really positive idea about the retrieve. Uh, also, the big thing for me is that dogs have this drive to scrap and fight and, and wrestle and stuff like that. So a lot of people will wrestle with their dogs on the ground, like, you know, smack them, and the dog kind of play bites them and stuff like that. Well, for me, I don't like it because it's very gray. Well, you can bite me now, but not that hard. But, oh, that's too hard. Well, that's not hard enough. Or this is blah, blah, blah. And I think the dog, it's very uh, confusing to the dog what's allowed and what's not. But with a tug, or with a biting toy, there's no other aspect in life that the dog can, uh, there's no other way for the dog to replicate this, which is, Bite this thing with everything you have. T 
tear into it, take all of your energy out on this thing, and nobody gets hurt and everything's fine. You can't do that with another dog. You can't do that with me. Uh, the only way we can do it is through tug play, or if you're doing bite work, you know, with like a suit or a sleeve or whatever, you can do it that way as well. But it's extremely valuable. So what we're going to suggest is you guys, you're going to watch what we're going to do. Play tug with your dog. I've never seen a dog become more dominant through playing, uh, playing tug. I've never seen a dog become more possessive through playing tug. Dogs do have dominance issues, possession issues, things like that, but it's not necessarily a reflection of tug play. And again, tug play will not enhance these particular um, uh, characteristics. And I think especially if you do it right mm -hmm. and you utilize your rules mm -hmm. of play. Mm -hmm. So yes, the dog is winning, but the dog has to do this and do that in order to win and in order to be reinforced and be rewarded. We're not, they're not just coming up and doing whatever they want and we just let them win every time. They no. have to come up and they have to play right. They have to know when to out. They have to know to bring the toy back to us. And by doing that, you create a dog that wants to play with you. Yeah, you know, the, the cool thing about the dog that we're going to use, her name is Chara, and she's about a seven or eight month old German Shepherd. And she's here for our uh, boot camp program. And when the, the owner sent me a video, he said, he, he said, well, we play, but she ends up biting me in the play. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. Because I've seen it before, very seldom. But I said, would you please send me a video? The guy sent me a video, and I watched the way he was playing with the dog, and it was very obvious why, why the dog was biting him. So the dog that we're going to use is this same dog who, when I started to play with her, uh, was not playing very well at all, didn't understand her power, didn't understand this whole bringing it back and stuff, and we're working on it. It's not done, but we're working on it. So it's a really good example of you to see how quickly, the dog's been here uh, not even two weeks, so you can see how quickly this behavior can develop into something very usable. And where I'm at with this dog, again, after two weeks of training, is I've now taken tug play and uh, incorporated it into our reward system. So the dog knows that there's a certain, uh, that, that the probability of play within our training is very great. So she is going to give me more energy, more drive, more focus in order to attain the reward, which in this case is the tug. So that's it. Another thing, uh, at the beginning of this, you talked about how this may be controversial. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe controversial is not the right word, but I think that people have opinions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those opinions come from specific situations and specific dogs. And then people start to assume, oh, this happened with this dog or this worked with this dog. So that's fact. Yep. That is how they every single dog... They, they generalize they, it. They generalize it. Yeah. And... Generalization is a big part of dog training, both for the dogs and for the trainers, mm -hmm. but every dog is different. Mm -hmm. So the more tools that you can put into your toolbox or the more different training techniques that you can learn and use, it may work with this dog, mm -hmm. may work with Fido, mm -hmm. but Sunny over here, it doesn't work with at all, but hey, good thing I learned this different technique from a different trainer because I can try to apply that. Now that's working with Sunny, but it wouldn't work with Fido. Yep. So the more different things that you can learn and have that knowledge, you can apply that to different dogs in different situations. And I think that's where controversy, mm -hmm. if we're going to call it that, mm -hmm. or opinions mm -hmm. really kind of... Uh, has a negative effect on our dog training because mm -hmm. we're not willing to be open-minded. Mm -hmm. We're not willing to learn new techniques that something worked for you that hadn't worked for me in the past. Mm -hmm. And now I'm saying, oh, well, that's dumb. That'll never work. Yeah. If it worked for you and it worked for you, dog, you're, it's not dumb. Yeah. Maybe I should think about that. And it didn't work for this dog that I'm training now, but a year from now, I get a new dog, and what I've been doing hasn't worked. And I think back, hey, remember that thing that Mark did that I thought was dumb at the time? I'm going to try it, and mm -hmm. now it works. Mm -hmm. And okay. I think, so that's, I think that that is the fundamental, um, oh, I don't know the right word, but this is what we as dog trainers, if this is what we're going to do, whether it's for a job or whether it's for fun, for a hobby with your own dog, you're training at a club, whatever, if you can have this open mind that you're talking about and not pass judgment on something you're unfamiliar with or something that didn't work for you in the past, it's going to make a world of difference in your whole overall approach to dog training in general. Like you said, there's a million ways to skin a cat. 
right? And it's just having all of these possibilities to use for you. Like you said, it's your toolbox. So, and if you're, and what I always suggest for people is if you just are working, if you guys are at home and you're working with your own dog and things are going very well, what I like uh, to suggest for people is to go to a shelter, go to your local shelter, volunteer, right? Life at a shelter, uh, excuse my language, sucks for dogs. So volunteer, get out there, take those dogs for walks, grab a toy, grab a rope, grab a tug, something like that with your leash, and try and play, and try and experiment with different dogs and see how they react, okay? It's a, it's a huge thing. And that will also expand your whole, your, not only your, your repertoire of your tools, but your awareness as to what's happening with this dog and this dog and this dog. A really great dog trainer is going to be able to adapt to every dog they're working with because they can feel it. They're not going to, I think it's really a terrible thing when somebody says, the dog doesn't fit into my system. Well, change your system, right? Your system's broke. Your system, you, if right. your system doesn't work with every dog, then you need to add another piece to the pie, another that, part to your system. That's right. I mean, a really good, anybody who does anything, whether they're working with animals or they're a builder or they're a, uh, a, a, a computer guy, tech guy, they're going to be able to come in, look at the situation and adapt and, uh, and accommodate the situation so that they can achieve the results. And I'll go down a little bit of a tangent here that does not necessarily have anything to do with play, which is what this video is going to be about. Hmm. But a good example of this is a few weeks ago, we had released a video with Cindy Rhodes uh, teaching the place beds and how to get onto a bed. And we were using luring mm -hmm. to get onto the bed. And there was a lot of comments on that video about using free shaping instead and how free shaping works better than luring. And the answer is that behavior can be taught lured or free shaped. Yeah. And if you incorporate luring into your training, and free shaping into your training, your dog not only understands how to be lured, mm -hmm. it also understands how to make decisions and mm -hmm. take an active role in their training through the free shaping, mm -hmm. but there's going to be times where maybe your dog can't figure something out, mm -hmm. and luckily you did some luring work in the beginning, so now you can put that help back in there mm -hmm. and work through those problem scenarios. Mm -hmm. So maybe you train the bed free shaping and you train something else luring or you train the bed luring, you train something else free shaping. But if your dog understands both techniques and you as a trainer understand both techniques, mm -hmm. you have the ability to apply what works to that dog in that situation no matter what comes up. So the more that you learn and the more that you teach your dog, the better you're gonna, your end results are going to be. And there isn't a right or a wrong answer. No, there there's what works. And if it works, it's right. Yeah. So. It's, do it, everything. It kind of goes back. There's an old, your dad probably knows this saying, because I heard, first heard this saying 20 years ago when I first started, but they used to have a saying in protection sports with like IPO and ring and stuff, which was obedience will show how good the handler is. Protection will show how good the dog is. Mm -hmm. Because a good, again, trainer, like exactly like you just said, you know, free shaping, takes a long time to get the initial steps, but yes, it's very, very, it, once the dog gets the behavior, it happens very fast and you're able to skip some steps. But I've trained every dog that comes here, and we, we do about 10 to 12 dogs a month, I train them to do touch pads, it's the first thing. And I'll tell you what, free shaping, when I only have four weeks to work with a dog, I'm sorry, but I, I don't have three days to try and free shape a touch pad, so I have to lure. Now, the big thing is, I go, okay, I have a luring, uh, technique, I have a luring ability to get the dog on the touch pad, but now because again my mind is open and I'm always um, improvising with what the dog is giving me, I see my opportunity to move away from luring and I can move away from luring, right? I don't get stuck in luring. This is why people have a negative idea. I don't like to use treats because then the dog doesn't work when I don't have treats. Well, if that's the case, you missed a big part in there, right? right? Because you have to, everything needs to be done with strategy. So we start by luring with treats, and as soon as we can get away from our lure a little bit, we move away and we move away and we move away. It's, it's normal. And to have these, again, abilities to be able to bounce back and forth with whatever you're doing is gonna make you a great dog trainer. And I think what we all want here, all of us who are watching this video, we're dog nerds, right? If you're watching the video, you're a training nerd, you're a dog nerd, 
you want to know more about this stuff because you're looking at two guys sitting in front of pictures talking about dog training, right? So the more that you feed that and, and um, enhance your own abilities, and the more you're able to work with other dogs and have great results and still be, it, it, the biggest thing about it for me is I feel like when I'm training a dog, I'm free. I'm free to adapt, to improvise. I play music as well. So it's like sitting, going and playing music with someone you've never played with before. And anybody who plays music knows sometimes it flies and sometimes it dies. But when you're playing and, you know, Jeff plays guitar, I play guitar, we start playing together. I'm adapting to what he's doing. He's adapting to what I'm doing. And this beautiful uh, symmetry kind of happens. And when we can ap apply this into our dog training and have this kind of freedom, it's a total joy. Because when dog training is not fun is when we don't have an answer, right? It's not going right. I can't figure out what to do. That's when dog training is not fun anymore. And it becomes frustrating. And we can beat our heads against the wall for months and months trying to figure things out. And a lot of times it's because our minds are closed and we're not willing to accept a different piece of information or a different technique. And those are those times where if you sat down and you watched a trainer, you watched a video like this, or you went to a seminar and you saw something that was working with them that at the time you weren't able to incorporate into your training or you didn't want to incorporate into your training, but in the back of your mind it's there. Mm -hmm. Then you get to that roadblock in your training where nothing that you normally does works. You pull that back out mm -hmm. and try something new. And best case scenario, it works. Worst case scenario, it doesn't work and mm. you have to do something else. Yeah, you but, try the next thing. But be flexible, yep. be open-minded yep. and try everything. And if it works in that situation with that dog, then you're doing the right thing. If it doesn't work, oh well, yeah, move on, big deal. try the next idea. Don't, another thing too, don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. Don't take anything personally. You're dancing with a partner who is not cooperating. That's essentially it. You're trying to communicate with another species, right? The dog doesn't speak our language. We're trying to figure out a way to give them the, uh, you know, different ideas, different direction, things like that. And <clears throat> I think, again, when you're free in your mind, you don't ever reach that state of frustration, of insecurity. You can even call it insecurity generally. Like, I'm insecure about my abilities, I'm insecure about this or that, or how the dog's going to react. You're not sure. So when you're not attached to an idea like that, and you have all these different abilities, and not say, oh, well, I, I only train with rewards. I only train with compulsion. I only train with electric collar. I only train with tugs. I don't use food, so on and so forth. You're really just locking yourself in a, a little tiny box that as soon as you're out of your comfort zone, you're uh, in trouble. You're not able to adapt. So having more tools, tug play, food rewards. If you don't use a clicker, for example, I messed around with the clicker for 10 years before I finally started to Im Im uh, apply it to my training system. And I used to make a lot of fun of people, like your dad did too, you know? I used to make a lot of fun of people who used a clicker, like, oh, get rid of that stupid thing, whatever. Now, I don't know what I would do without a clicker. So this is, this is, uh, and I'm happy with myself for that, that I, that I was able to overcome my pre-existing idea and see the light, right? And this is going to happen to us. And I think as long as we keep going with this flow throughout our lives, and you know we're going to keep, if you're dog nerds, you're going to have dogs your whole life and you're going to keep messing around with stuff your whole life. So you're going to keep trying new things and experimenting with new things. And if you're not, and you're just trying the exact same thing that you did with the first dog that you ever owned, That'd be boring. Yeah, it'd be. I wouldn't kind of like you want to be into dog training if you're just doing the same thing over and over. No, it'd be again. boring for you. It'd be boring for the dog. You know, I would say in that case, you know, get a gerbil, because <laughs> you can do the same thing with a gerbil. You right. can go and you can click and you can, you know, have motivational training, reward-based training, and never step outside of your whatever. But the reality is, with a dog, a dog is something that's in our lives socially. They go with us places. They're in social environments. So not only do we need training, we need behavior and all these different things, but again, having the ability to adapt to every situation, every dog, is really what's going to make you guys better trainers. And that, at the end of the day, uh, I think for all of us, you, me, it's not about my dog, it's about me being able to uh, effectively and fairly teach and deliver the information to the dog and have as many possible uh, 
varieties of methods that I can use that are at my disposal because it's just going to get me to the result faster. And again, not being attached to each one of those methods or, or one particular method. All right, well, I think that uh, we went down a couple of little tangents here. <laughs> we were going to just talk about the, the play techniques three we're going to be using. But three minutes. I think that uh, that was good. So with that said, let's uh, run over to the training room over here, grab our dog, and get to it. Get some play done. Nice. All right, you guys, here we are with Chara. Okay, what I've got, just so you can break down the equipment real quick, I have a, a British slip lead, which is one of my favorite pieces of equipment. I have a, a very thin light line attached to that, which gives me this much room, and you're gonna see how I use the line in order to help reinforce uh, the bringing the tug back for more tug play. She's excited. The other thing I'm using is a good tug. This is a tug I got from Leerberg. It's, um, it's, uh, I think this is linen, right, Jeff? This is linen material. It's eight inches. You, you know, maybe uh, Jeff can flash right now the model number of the tug I'm using. I love this tug, okay? So a good tug is huge. It's got to be durable. I like a handle, okay? I don't like two. I like one handle. You can use two if you like, but I do like just to have one handle. So I've got my line in my left hand. I'm right-handed. I've got my tug in my right hand. The first thing I'm going to do is make drive, and that's going to be done by making a couple misses. So I'm going to show her the toy to grab, and as she goes to grab it, I'm going to move it away uh, like an animal, like she tries to catch the animal and it moves away. That's going to create more drive. Ready? Here we go. And then I'm going to let her grab it. Good girl. Once she bites it, the first thing I'm going to do is put a lot of torque into it, so you're probably going to see me take it from her. See what I mean? Because what that's going to do is create a really, uh, what I do want the dog to do is bite very hard. I want her to bite with everything she's got. See what I mean? So I can take it at those pivotal times if I feel like she's slacking. So I've got my other hand on the leash here, and what I'm going to do is grab the tug with a fixed grip and watch her take it when she pulls harder. Oh, see? Now she wants to feel that again, so she's already bringing it to me. I pull, she wins. I pull, she wins. I can use my leash if I need to help reinforce her coming back to me. I pull, she pulls, she pulls harder, she gets a legitimate win. And you see what the dog is doing, bringing it back so that she can experience that win again. We're also going to provide you with a video, really short video, from Chara's owner, who sent me uh, the video of her playing, so you can see how far the dogs come in just a couple weeks. And actually, I can say her biting changed, her biting behavior, play behavior, changed once I started playing with her within about two minutes. See what I mean? So it's very important that I don't do this. See, she didn't win it right there. But I hold it, now we're both fighting equally, pulling equally, and when she pulls it harder, she wins, feeling more powerful. Okay, she wins, I back up, she brings it, she pulls again, she wins, she keeps bringing it, you see, wanting to experience that again. So just to give you an idea, when I started playing with Chara, and I let her win, she took off and said, this is mine, I'm gonna keep it. Because she didn't understand where the real joy is, which isn't in the actual, not in the owning of it, but the actual win. Okay, another thing you can always do, pet your dog. Don't take it from them. If they drop it, that's a great opportunity to start with some drive again. Good girl. You get into your tug. If you can time your time it so the dog thrashes it. Now, one thing I should talk about: if I'm holding for a long time, and I feel the dog start to deaden up, like kind of go flat in the bite, because I'm waiting for her to make a what I call a power move, pulling or shaking, and I need to re-engage the play, I can just give it a quick snap. Okay, and that will kind of 
bring the toy back to life. So I can grab my leash in case I need it. Okay. So I don't play tug without a leash on the dog. And that's going to help reinforce the rules. But you see, rules, the rules are important. But rules are a funny word because I'm manipulating the dog into doing it without saying, you need to get over here and you need to do this. Or you need to not do that. It's more of a giant manipulation tactic. See what I mean? Now no leash. And now people who like to wrestle with their dogs, I don't like to do that like I said before. But what I do like to do when I'm starting to play tug, now we have this safely between us. So I can do all of my wrestling moves that I would do on the floor with the dog at home while safely having a tug in between. Another thing you really want to do too is play vigorously. Don't play soft. If you play soft, you'll have a soft dog. You want the dog to really, just like we want our children and our dogs to be the strongest and the best they can be, we want to bring that out of them. And the only way to do that is by rising to the occasion and making the play or work, whatever you want to call it, more difficult, more challenging. So I'm really ganking on this thing right now. See, there's no light play going on here. And she has to rise to the occasion. Now you see I'm waiting. If I feel like she's falling asleep, I can re-engage that again. But she's still there. Now watch with my fingers. See how I did that? I held it with my fingertips. So what ends up happening, she gets a legitimate win. Which means as she pulls it, she feels it break free from my hand. And that is extremely powerful. So that's why the timing of when you let the dog win is very important, if not even the most important thing. And again, letting her win can easily, Chara, okay, can easily be turned into your retrieve behavior. Come here. There you go. See what I mean? So now I've already created a retrieve uh, informally through play, right? So again, the big part about this is having the dog bring it back to you to play. Going and getting it is never hard, right? It's always bringing it back to share. And again, it's all taught through letting her win. All right, so Jeff just asked Sonny for a behavior. There he goes, he's playing vigorously. There you go. Mm -hmm. Notice Jeff didn't ask too much. Sonny's in a new room, new environment. There you go, good boy. So Jeff asked for a little bit of uh, like a healing and then rewarded Sonny with the tug. So the tug, there he goes. You see, so Jeff was just, uh, this is a play-by-play, -play, guys. Jeff is... You know, keeping active movement, lets the dog win, brings it back, Sonny, or moves back, Sonny brings the tug back for more play. Jeff holds a fixed solid grip, Sonny pulls a little harder, Sonny wins. A legitimate win. Here it goes again, see? So what Jeff is actually doing, there you go. And see if the dog loses it, Jeff makes more drive. Makes more drive. We call it snooze you lose. Yeah. Oh! In that case, Sonny just won. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Watch. And the release. See? So Sonny pulls, 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 and Jeff is saying, eh, you got to pull harder, buddy, to win that. So he freezes it again, holds that fixed grip. Sonny pulls and wins. And look at the joy in the dog. Let him win again for us, Jeff. Watch the dog's demeanor after he wins. Watch his tail. Look at him. Does that look like a happy dog? And when he brings it to Jeff, he's saying, grab it, re-engage play, re-engage play. Yes. Good. Just to show you how valuable the tug play is, Jeff didn't command the dog. 
The dog chose to <coughs> execute a behavior that seemed the most logical to him at the time. Jeff rewarded him. So the dog wants the tug so bad that he's trying to offer a behavior that he thinks will yield the reward of the tug. It's going to probably do the same thing. Okay, a little healing. Nice. Yes. Nice. Okay. So you can see how easy it is to use tug play as a system of reward even on its own. There you go. A good thing to uh, witness here is the fact that Jeff brought Sonny into a room. Sonny has it. If Sonny's been in this room, it's been at least a year ago. Nice. Beautiful. Yes. There you go. And what Jeff was mentioning is that when he first got in here, Sonny didn't have the same extreme attitude about playing. He was a little bit unsure because of the new environment. Yeah. And now he can lift them up. So, see, because Sonny wasn't completely committed, but now he's comfortable. So the lesson to be learned through that, guys, is don't ask too much, okay, initially, until you feel the dog develop. And you were able to feel all that, right, Jeff? Oh, yeah, he's tugging a lot harder. Mm -hmm. His a lot more solid now when he first walked in. Mm -hmm. Because for the first couple times, he saw me, I swung over this way, uh -huh. he did that. Yeah, he dropped it. Mm -hmm. And now, he's hanging out a lot Mm-hmm. I think the most important thing to, to witness here, though, is again, look at, look at the dog's tail. Side. Side. There you go. Side. See how happy the dog is? Believe me, the dog is not happy to be healing. The dog is happy to be working to get that reward. He's got a good work ethic because he enjoys the pay. That's the idea behind fair training. Look at that guy. See his? Yes. And look at his tail going. Look at his tail just going and going and going and how happy he looks. And again, when Jeff lets him win, <clears throat> look at how quick he is to bring it back. Even he's in a strange building next to a kennel full of dogs. And as curious as he is in those things, Play is still more important or more valuable than satisfying his curiosity of his environment. See? So tug play can actually develop a stronger, more confident dog, more secure, more stable. As we're seeing right here. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, the, you know, Jeff has been working with Sonny since he got him at eight weeks and been doing everything with quite a bit of strategy. So, a lot of times we're, we, we're, we're not all in that particular situation. So, the, uh, what Jeff was just saying, yeah, tough dog. What Jeff was just saying is how the dog has no um, ideas of keeping it for himself. His whole idea with Tug is to share and play with Jeff. Mm -hmm. He's getting a little. And you can also notice uh, the dog right now, it's about in this room, it's about 55 degrees. And so it's not too warm. But look at how the dog is, is panting, which means he's working out. So that's another benefit of Tug play. It can physically exercise our dogs in ways that we uh, cannot duplicate, even sprints, okay? So my analogy or my likening with tug play is uh, ask any of you guys out there to go out and hit a heavy bag for 60 seconds, punch a heavy bag, and you'll have an idea of what a dog goes through after one minute of tug. It's extremely, uh, it, can be, it can be extremely exhausting. All right. Ooh, is he all happy? Great. All right, so I hope that you guys uh, enjoyed that and found that useful. Uh, we had a lot of fun here. And uh, 
If you guys would like to learn more about the rules of play and how we generate this play work and incorporate it into our training, Mark has a great online course uh, titled The Rules of Play. Teaching um, your dog the rules of play. And it's on Learberg and it's available now. It's a self-study course. I think it's what, three or four modules? Three, three modules. Uh, I can't even remember. It was a year and a half ago or so. We did, but but it's a great course. I would recommend uh, if this was interesting, diving into that course and really learning more about it. So That's a great course because it goes into a lot of detail into the actual um, physics of how we play, or the mechanics, I guess is actually a better word, of how you feel things and stuff like that. You're going to be able to see it here, and hopefully you'll be able to replicate what you see when you try this stuff at home. But if you need more information, which is possibly you might, it's a, it's a real quick self-study, you know, relatively inexpensive course that you can go take. And for me, uh, playing, having good tug play is a, it's, it's as game changing for our training is having good marking. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Mark, thank you for doing that demonstration. Pleasure. Thank everybody for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Keep it up, guys.